guys, what's up? It's me, Thomas. Today, we're back here with Josh Scorcher with the top 10 fan-made villain songs. So, yeah, basically, YouTube videos covering some famous, you know, villains. I think I could think of a few. Like, you know, Alice's game, you know, I got a game I want to show you. If I tell him your name, you gotta play too. You know that. <laughs> and, well, there's a lot, but if I recognize them, I'll let you know, but I have further ado. Let's see which one hits the top 10. Be sure to like Scott for more. Hope you enjoy. Let's go. Two and a half years ago, I hosted Villain Songs Month. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Non-villain, theater, TV, media. video games. But now, mm -hmm. I want to give some attention to villain songs made by those consuming said media. The fans. Villain songs AKA are famous us. among nerdcore artists, and chances are you have listened hey, to several of them yourself. Same rules as villain songs. Okay. They have to have lyrics, mm -hmm. can be sung by or about the villain, or sung from the villain's perspective, and only one per franchise. Otherwise, they'd all be from FNAF. <laughs> now, because this is fan-made villain songs, I have to put in some additional rules. One, only one, one per creator. Two, mm -hmm. no parody songs. These need to be original compositions. And three, the song's suitability. Like, can we envision the song fitting neatly into a movie, stage show, a TV show, a video game, or even a book? So basically, yes, if it fits the franchise, you'll be good to go. Also, one more thing before we begin. Please remember that there are an unholy amount of fan-made villain songs, and narrowing True. it down to 10 was harder than you think. Not only is it harder to get noticed in the genre of fan-made content, but even then, a lot of the songs that got popular felt a little off, like how off? good, but it was hard to decipher which songs felt like real villain songs and which ones felt like they were just random posturing for the sake of posturing, like Ouch. they were tributes. Eventually, many of them started to blur together. All that's to that say, bad? please be nice about my choices. There are enough fan-made villain songs to make a whole other month's worth of countdowns for them. They <laughs> have some favorites to make villain songs out of, don't they? Thank Most of them are indie horror I or cartoons. Most of the Undertale ones were parodies. Not dissing, <laughs> just noticing patterns. I think it just depends on the artist. You know, some do covers, some do original songs, and some do parodies. It really depends on the artist you listen to, right? <laughs> Here we go. Let's see who's first. I like the transitions to Pentium. Speaking of the FNAF song, I might as well just get it over with. Mm -hmm. Like I said, go through every FNAF song would take me forever. Same with the lore, but since we're here, let's sure. talk about William Afton, FNAF's infamous purple Ooh, the purple guy. guy. Purple guy! Afton Thanks, Mark. was the co-owner of the Fazbear Entertainment so, Company. So, who's the songwriter? And the one who created the animatronics to begin with. He's also the serial killer behind the deaths of many <laughs> children and stuffed their corpses and souls into the robots he made. Yeah, it's messed up. Given there are a lot of songs for FNAF out there, there are quite a few for Afton himself. The one I chose is the one I think got his personality Three? the best. Unbroken by Man on the Internet. These machines are singing with the blaring and the bleeping I don't think I've seen this one before. Yep, Afton's one of those. Actually, I don't think I've he's not just listened to many in a while. He's an artist. Just, For some context, I don't think just listen to Juno songs will be real. Inventor on the surface, but deep down he takes glee from his yeah. That's Michael, he's not children, as a means to an end for him. What is it, like French? Or Torque French, sorry. As for the why he's doing this, he's a coward who fears the aftermath of death. He uses the souls of children Wasn't as a way to, to gain to get her starter back? Don't. Ask me how he thinks that will work. As you can probably tell, he's not the most sane. The song does nope. a good job not only telling us Afton's warped perspective, but 
Also, the changes between that when was this release? and the purple man showing us the duality he holds within himself. So I'm trying to remember when this took place, but wasn't the original thing just to make sure, like, got her daughter back, I think? I can't remember. In the end, he does get his wish. He gains immortality, but with his soul stuck in the spring trap suit. The revenge the children's souls gained was sweet, but led to new problems. After the yep. catchphrase is, I always come, come back. back. He's the type of villain who will always return no matter what happens. Even with his body mangled, his soul trapped, fueled by his lust for killing and his drive to achieve immortality, his will shall not be diminished, and he will make sure his name is etched. Forever. Into history. He is truly unbroken. Let dust after the guy. Am I not? You ever wonder what your favorite Disney baddies do after those accursed heroes get there? Wait, wasn't there a villain movie where goes around comes around? Comes I mean, around? Besides chilling on the house of mouse waiting for Disney Plus to take a hint. <laughs> well, filling in the blanks is often where the fans come in. And True. according to Patty Kate Productions, the oh, villains, villains layer, layer, oh, they hang out in a spooky castle plotting huh. their revenge with menacing collab songs. I really love the concept of this web series. Huh. Usually the villains and their songs are the best parts of Disney flicks. You True. Know, back when they gave a hoot and didn't have to play it safe. Among these dastardly collabs is the first season's second episode, Top oh. of Love, featuring the company's <laughs> most wicked stepmoms. Lady Tremaine, Mother Gothel, and Queen Grimhild. Wait, the evil stepmom had a name? Uh, Grimhild. Evil Queen from Snow White. Anywho, hmm. these nasty divas come together to sing about what <laughs> great mothers they were. But how the heck do you justify trying to kill off your child for having a prettier face, turning your dead husband's kid into a maid in her own house, or child abduction and gaslighting? Pretty much. Anything you say. That's love? love? Little childhood trauma built character. Aw, ain't they the spitting image of motherly Thanks, vibes. Eddie. Versus like that really show off how brilliant the song is. We already know how horrible these three are just from their movies alone, but this just adds Ooh, a few extra yikes. steps. They claim they tried to toughen their kids up by treating them like dirt. It's implied that Grimhild snuffs Snow White's father. Gothel even says she never wanted kids. Oof. Ouch. Oh, that excuse gets a lot heavier if you see the Tangled series. Along with everything, I'm good. Beat, I love how tough love ties these three miserable bats themes together. They all basically commit the same crime, mistreating their adopted daughters for their own selfish desires. The only real difference is that one of them made it out alive at the end of the day. In a way, tough love well, depends if you read the book a story or the story. Told story. From the Count of Monte Cristo, another fantastic villain song Ooh. about three irredeemable creeps coming together to try and justify their common goal of destroying an innocent person's life. The theme worked brilliantly there, and it works just as well here, adding an extra level of depravity to these classic villainesses. Call us wicked, call us mean, cruel and everything in between. You can say it's unjust, turning their dreams to dust. This is what we call love. You three need psychiatrists. Sheesh. Now, if only actual Disney could remember how to get that deep with its films. But no, we got a villain in name only singing a doo doo pop number with redundant lyrics. I'll let you live it for free and I don't even charge you it. Number eight. When you 
hear fan-made villain songs and take into account that I'm a brony, there's mm -hmm. a song that I'm willing to bet a lot of you immediately thought of. Discord by oh. Eurobeat Brony. This huh, the Looney Tunes legendary song, song says about how Discord took the world away, painting him as this almost apocalyptic threat. It's iconic in the community. And as for what I think about it, well... Oh! <laughs> that sounds about right. Down. I'm not saying it's bad. It just doesn't really sound like a Discord song. Even at his worst, Discord's more of a prank-obsessed trickster god who just finds messing with mortals fun, like a kid playing with toys. Far from the yeah, that does sound about right. For him, evil and I didn't even watch the show. Portrays him as. Now, if only there were a song that fit our Draconicus friend while still sounding villainous. Well, he did get reformed. Maybe we need to look for the one where he's not the villain, but someone else is. Oh. Oh, hey, Bill. I know. <laughs> oh, hello, Death Battle. Damn. And gentlemen and everything in between feast your eyes on the most chaotic thing the multiverse has ever suffered okay yeah i know what you're thinking does death battle count is this a villain song if <sighs> wasn't jt music that made the music yes and yes for one yes death battle and is yes. a fan-made project as mm -hmm. professional as it is it's a series analyzing characters from different media and interpreting them as fans True. to see what would happen in a crossover as for the second point it's a song sung about and by Bill Cipher and Discord. So even if you don't think Discord counts as a villain anymore, Bill Discord absolutely does. is. It counts. The Cipher does. Something out of the way. Discord and the Cipher is insane. Right out of the gate. This is a song less explaining some sort of grand master evil plan and more of these two chaos gods having fun dissing each other while also messing with the audience. Hi. <laughs> Props to Brandon Gates and Mr. Goatee for managing to capture the sound and inflections of Bill and Discord while also keeping the song going. Discord's insults are more playful and creative, using poetic language and even puns to make fun of the triangular terror. Bill, on the other hand, is fueling his ego, boasting about his achievements while also touching on his murderous side. Tell me Discord. Does sound like he's fighting his own ego there, huh? And this isn't even mentioning the main course. That seems like these two are directing their attention to the audience itself, asking them to sell their souls to them and try to figure out some hidden truths. I rather trust this score. Thank Check you, Sniper. Complex and close the debate for the fight was, and how looking through every detail can drive one crazy. It gets meta. Just how you'd expect from this fight. Sell your soul, take control by gold. Can you decipher the secret meaning? Line by line, wrong the right, pick a side. And spread the discord to those still sleeping. <laughs> Wait, run the Wait, back. let's see. Let's see. Why are you even listening to this part <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Let's <yeah. laughs> give props to Infotron. Okay. His backing track captures the mysterious, crazy, Thanks, and mind melting nature of these two, sounding similar to something that would be in Gravity Falls, but also sounding like the very soundtrack is actively fought over and affected by the reality warping. Of all the songs made for Death right. Battle, Discord <laughs> Decipher feels like it truly captures the character of these two feeling not only like a song they're singing to each other and the audience but sounding like they're fighting over the song itself hats off to you brandon gates i just hope the song didn't require any deals extra. with the devil yes it's not the first time someone made a deal with the devil for musical talent <laughs> yeah that does sound about right i actually did watch that death battle never saw the song though so i gotta check out I actually don't remember they actually played during the actual battle, because Brandy H does a lot of the background stuff for Death Battle. 
like I think I remember one of his like good songs or like or at least one of the songs I know of was like the background for like the Dark Souls boss versus the you know Dragonborn. Can't remember what the main character's name was in that one. So, but huh. so we had man on the internet. Ugh. The villains layer now death battle. All right. I mean, Death Battle is a fan project, why not? So, I say it counts. <laughs> I still remember the Scooby Doo Courage one, you know. It's kind of a riff on the old table, not again. You know that? Can't remember if it was Brandon that did it. Because I know JT actually did, like, the one with Miles and, you know, Static. Coming along with this great power broker's responsibility. You know that. Sorry, I had to go there. All right, let's see what's next. Seven, coming up. we've never met. Hi, I'm Josh Scorcher. I talk about video games and the perpetual blunders of the industry. The top 10 fails, everybody. And I think you know where this is going. Todd Howard of Bethesda. I made it a bunch Ladies and gentlemen, let's bring out the chalk ears. For it. Well, it just works. Marketing gimmick. Everybody's a sucker for horse armor. And you better believe others have gotten the chance to clown on Mr. Howard's boneheaded plays. Of course, one of the catchiest spoofs, and one you probably saw coming, F3. was the Chalk Eaters. It just works. Here it comes. Yes, corporations count as villains. <laughs> F*** you. Look at these <laughs> ongoing downward spirals and tell me otherwise. The yeah, song that's a point. itself is a jumping high energy jazz number featuring dear old Todd, performed by Kyle Wright, not even trying to deny all the dumb, shady practices his company's taken part in. Overhyped games turning True. out buggy as hell, mm -hmm. inflated DLCs, flashy shows covering up mediocrity, that freaking horse armor! He does it all Yeesh. and relishes every second of it. You know why? He just works, he just works, did a lot of stunning and show people why money flows. He just works. And in a way, <laughs> he's right. right. Despite everything, Bethesda is alive and still there. Disappoint to rip us off another day. Ooh, and the bridge in the middle. And then oh, yeah. <laughs> of angry, frustrated consumers crying out for the company to clean up its ass. Here we go. Yay. So many reasons yeah, why this song's still doing it. Tragic, from its abiding satire to its catchy. That's why I haven't really played any of the best games. Epic choir bit, you know? It perfectly encapsulates what a three-ring circus the gaming industry has become. All while giving Tom the presence of a Disney villain. Bravo! We've memed the heck out of the song, and unless things change, you better believe the show ain't over yet. It just works. It just works. I think even the last end line says. Who's left now? So who's left now? Apparently him. Because I think some people still buy it. So next this next song's about death. And I don't mean it metaphorically or rhetorically or poetically or theoretically or in any other fancy way. I can't name a soul oh, who initially boots. thought a second Puss and Boots oh. movie was a good idea, except for DreamWorks. But holy smash mouths all-star. Puss in yeah. Boots, the, the last, last wish, wish, baby. The movie that the right. needed after an onslaught of so-so sequels. True. The drastic change in animation style to the impeccable visual storytelling. And of course, give us two of the Best antagonists yep. in modern Jack Horner animation. and Death. One of them was an irredeemable monster that was snubbed in favor of Pinocchio. Oh, wait, that actually happened twice. And Man. the other was a wolf that took on the role of the Grim Reaper himself. While Big Jack Horner so was to be more one. of a handsome Jack type, with the snark in complete disregard for his servants, Death is a dark and intimidating hunter who has literally kept track of our hero's past lives by marking them on his sights. Needless to say, the internet went ham on making villain songs for this personification of death. You know, it sure wasn't just the furry bait with Luna from Hell of a Boss. Man. There were quite a few good ones, and I ultimately landed on the song Death's Doorstep, written oh. and produced by Music Clyde. What he likes to do right. with his songs instead of performing himself, oh. hire other nerdcore artists huh. to be his vocalists. And this time around, he hired singer Totoro-chan. 
while not Total a very true. well known singer on YouTube, she huh. is a frequent collaborator with Music Live, and her vocal right. performance here perfectly Sarah. captures what one might feel when confronting what could be their final moments. Speaking of which, the lyrics are actually very unique, while simultaneously being what you'd expect. Most fan-made songs about death tend to be told from his perspective, as he's chasing down our titular hero. This song, however, is from told with the POV of someone running from death. It touches on the tale of how Puss and Boots always laughed in the face of death, but once he sees his face for the first time, he realizes that by living on the edge, he may fall off and never get back up. Ocean's actually sounds pretty good. What do you guys think? Not just the lyrics, the music's also incredibly unique. When listening to most of the songs made about death, I noticed that they were mostly posturing rap, and it got very samey. This Fair. one is a bit more pop-oriented, and it has some decent chord progression as a result. I especially love the sight sounds that get louder and louder as the song goes on, like how death slowly but surely comes for us all. Oh, I made myself sad. Death's doorstep may be similar in terms of exploring themes of mortality, Amen. but it gets the spot of how it separates itself enough from other songs made about death. It puts the listener in the shoes, or boots, of someone trying to flee the inevitable end. But as the song and the movie suggest, we need to live our lives to the fullest because, try as we may, we won't be able to cheat death. <laughs> Now, if only dreamers could keep making beautiful movies like Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, instead of doing whatever they did recently. Yeah. And out. Fan culture oh. really is hey, something, digital. huh? It has been no tells hmm. case. All it took was just a pilot for the internet's creative juices True. to flow like. Wait, is this Alistair's as game? Well as That's the only song I can think of. Pop on her socials and conventions. Oof. As a Broadway-inspired show taking place in hell of all places, hmm. of course, the various demons and sinners had their share of songs emphasizing their more violent and. Uh, wasn't this from the TV show, though? But out of everyone in the cast, none have captivated fans more than the radio demon, Alistor. This Creole-inspired yeah, serial killer Let's immediately begin. established himself as one of the series' standout characters, and for good reason. So, sure. of course, everyone had their shot at making a villain song to fit him. But which to choose? Insane and Alistor's game were big contenders, True. but oh? pound for pound? I have to go with paranoid DJ smile like you mean it. This world is wrong, but a simple game. Not a case of what you know, but who? Here we go. Looking at you, I think perhaps you're wanting more than table scraps. So just imagine what a man like me could do for you. Like any good Broadway song, Smile Like You Mean It tells a story. We follow a nameless sinner down on his luck, resenting his place in the world. He wishes there was some way to climb up the ladder, some way but to get back at those who have wronged him. Fortunately, came our boy Alistair. Fortunately, it seems his desperation has caught the attention of a certain someone who offers him a deal that seems too good to pass up. Right away, Paranoid DJ deserves all the applause for writing, producing, and singing this entire thing. Alistair is written and sounds nearly identical to how he is in canon, which is quite the feat because, reminder, this was when all we had was the, the pilot. pilot. Alistair's a true salesman. The one of a kind, the, the charming a demon bell. And swing tune with tons of his radio flair. Alistair's an entertainer at heart, and this song, absolutely, entertains. Yet true to his devilish nature, Alistair brazenly admits that this deal isn't all that it seems. Even our right states that he's waiting with bated breath to watch the poor schmuck falter and spiral downward, yet he still sounds convincing. Smile like you mean it. Take a chance and you could seize it. 
He ropes Husk into it. Husk is a bitter, drunken soul who, as revealed in the show, was once an overlord who gambled his soul away to Alistair, Whoops. unable to pay his debts with anything but servitude. While the song came out before the full reveal of Husker's plight, Husk's verse still conveys his story as a cautionary huh. tale. He doesn't want to be here, and you can tell. He warns the sinner about Alistair's power and basically states that once the radio demon has his sights on you, he won't let go. go. They say you they reap what you sow, and in this and town you should get and will know that what the, the radio demon wants, he's gonna take. I've seen him kill hell's greatest evil, shake the status quo in the fable. So if you think you're gonna be out of this, big mistake. Now, now, sourpuss. Even with all these warning signs, Alistair's deal is still very tempting because. What other choice do you have in hell? Everyone's out to get you, so why not take a deal with one of the top dogs? Surely nothing ever goes wrong when you sell your soul to a demon. <laughs> yeah. Ah, sarcasm. Smile Like You Need It tells such a convincing story that it feels like it absolutely could belong and has been proper. Alistair's persistence in smiling no matter what comes your way and malicious insistence on his deal being absolute feels almost like Paranoid DJ knew how Alistair's characterization was going to go in the show. It's good enough to be canon, and that's a hyperbole, by the way. One of Paranoid DJ's other songs, Look My Way, oh, recently oh. became canon to Hell of a Boss. If that's not a sign of the way Paranoid DJ can capture these characters, I don't know what is. I'll give him credit. Good job, buddy. It's not the only one. Okay, I swear this ah, isn't here's the bending pony. rules to put two pony villain songs on the same list because but Discord wasn't the first one was isn't the... the villain in Discord Decipher. Villains. Yeah, now we that's can true. Now we actual fan villain song from the franchise. We touched on a few MLP G4 villain tunes back when I did Cluster Villain Girls. Songs Month, but if you thought the villain songs Daniel Ingram made for these characters were amazing, look at the hmm. massive menagerie of villain songs made by the Brony fandom. There are several obvious right, choices there. that you absolutely need to go Passes. listen to right now. Stronger, sung by Black Griffin and featuring the voice of Apple Blue, Blue. the aforementioned <laughs> Discord song I made a nostalgia True. credit joke about. Heck, that's not even counting the songs based on fan yeah. fiction. And don't oh, yeah. even get me started on the majestic heavy hitter The Moon Rises by Pony Phonic. With all these fan favorite, don't fan made done. villain songs, it was tough to decide which one to choose. In the end, I went with... None of these. Huh? This is maddeningly unhelpful. No Instead, I'm talking about Son of the Night? Of the Night by JYC Rowe. Yeah, I know it's not one of the huh? iconic fan-made villain songs for the good old days of 2012, nor is it about any of the first MLP villains that may come to your mind like Discord, Cozy Glow, or Queen Chrysalis, but True. come on, man, this song is so freaking epic. Just huh? listen to it. Whoa. Yikes! Son of the Night is a song that takes place from the perspective of a pony who worships one Daybreaker, Princess Celestia's equivalent to Nightmare Moon, who appears in the episode A Royal Problem. Yes, I know she was just an apparition in a dream, but it counts because... Dang. If Luna can turn into Nightmare Moon, you can absolutely turn into me. Daybreaker is True. essentially a representation of Celestia's dark side. A glimpse into the world of eternal Whoa. day. Oh. But for the pony singing this song, that's all well and good. Huh. The lyrics sing the praises of Daybreaker and convey a longing for the light of the morning to reign over the land. After all, isn't light more reverent and purer than darkness? Isn't light always good and darkness always bad? Okay, this better not secretly be a Xehanort song because he doesn't deserve one this good. This song, as surprised. song about Daybreaker it's should, damn. includes a lot of parallels to Nightmare Moon. It may even, dare I say, contain parallels to church music. I mean, the way the song is written is meant to worship, and you can definitely hear the similarities. Oh, 
Yikes. It really makes you wonder just how much power Celestia is holding back. What if underneath this calm, reserved, and dignified ruler is something go. more reckless, selfish, sinister even? Nice. This, perspective, this song is breathtaking. The way uh, nice JYC Rose's orchestral sound and so Felicia oh Carrera's vocals come together Jesus. is just beyond description. The way the orchestra hits on each chorus and then swells up for that final chorus at the end, it's, it's a song out of League of Legends. I don't know how many songs from the fandom that are about Daybreaker, so it's nice that JYC Rose could give her a moment in the spotlight. It actually does give an idea of, like, what would have happened if, like, Luna was the same one, but Celestia just went a little too far. Think about it. Like, Luna went to Nightmare Moon because she was jealous. But what if Celestia actually fed into that? Like, think about it. More ponies, you know, appreciate the day more than the night. So, in a way, Daybreaker's kind of an alter ego. Which, in a way, we do always have that little shadow in the back thinking, what would happen if we all went a little crazy? <laughs> I know I just went Joker, but come on. You know that's what's, what could happen, right? <laughs> anyway, final three. Let's just see where things go from here. Horror indie games get oh. so much fan content, it's ridiculous. While that does mean I have to sift through a lot of so-so entries, there's so Ouch. many that at least one of them has to knock it out of the park. So okay. let's check out Bendy and the Ink Machine, a game that puts a sinister spin hmm. on Walt Disney's humble beginnings by having I which Bendy song. be a singing demon. I think demon I know of a builder machine you all die the night. The story revolves around Henry Stein as he is invited back to the so old. So there's that in the odd of darkness. Oh, the dead, the dead, it's below high to hope. Say that Henry's old old are quite go. You know, happy to see him after he left them to be. Where are we going with this? So, given the modern spin on classic animation, that probably means we're gonna get some <gasps> swing. Wait. Oh yeah! Oh, I remember this one. Hit a hell of a show, and you're in the front row. Oh, and you welcome home. You've been away for far too long. The song "Welcome Home" first made by Yo. Henry Lane gives us a look. Yeah, into I remember this. Titular ink demon as he welcomes Henry back with a 1920s. Dude, I remember this one. This is the good. Song was first produced in 2018, but for this entry, I think it was like Squidly did. I think this one is made with the help of Alicia Michelle and Cody Fulbrook on the trombone. The original song was already catchy <laughs> as hell, but. This version of the song elevates that. The lyrics aren't nearly as deep as the previous <laughs> entries on the list, but there are plenty yeah, of could be worse. references here and there, and Benji's resentment for Henry is made abundantly clear. This may be a fun, <laughs> bouncy, upbeat ragtime number, but you really feel the venom, betrayal, and it's still can't erase this time. of the villain thanks to Haley's delivery. And now all the curtain finally close. You'll see. The result of what you chose. Did it have to go this way? Maybe if you'd only stayed, all this tragedy could have been prevented. But you found the posters and the reel of a tape. A new dimension for us could be the seal of your fate. In all the years you left and rotten here, and nothing but rejection made a fear and cold. So give us one world. And yes, this isn't the only song yeah, made about true. Bendy and the Ink Machine. Build Our Machine is a fan favorite for sure, True. and for good reasons. Good. I love me some Electro Swing, but I prefer this one because of how accurate wow. it is to the time period. Everybody involved <laughs> in this song clearly understands Bendy and the Ink Machine well enough to make the sound almost like a theme song for the game. It's made even better with a True. fantastically done animated music video. Though if I had, I don't any know. I think the original one's a little better because you know. Just be glad you didn't live to see yourself become modern day Disney. Oof. You know, maybe I'm taking too many pot shots at Disney. Nah. <laughs> and let him have it. <laughs> Number two. Let's go. You're the reason why I get up at four o'clock in the afternoon and pump iron until my chest is positively sick. You don't need to be that deep in the DC so... fandom to recognize that Batman and the Joker have a very... Um, okay, I'm kind of curious to see where this is going. Inside with the Arkham games, Miracle of Ooh. Sound decided to really highlight the dysfunctional so, dynamic within eerie waltz by the clown prince of hmm. crime himself. Appropriately titled Miracle of Sound, huh? Joker's song. Okay, okay, what the title lacks in originality, the song itself makes up for with substance. The melody right. is this slow I gotta hear. And sinister, almost resembling a fairground organ. 
Through the twisted tune, the Joker is serenaded the bat, presumably from the other side because of the whole dead thing. And the lyrics paint a what was this released again? What goes Just on in that kind of curiosity. brain of his. We are two of a kind, kind. violent and sound of mind. You're the yin to my yang, can't, can't you see? And if I were to leave, you would grumble and grieve, face and back. Bats, you'd be lost, lost without me. But of course, Bats and the Joker are the same. Two normal schmoes who fell out the deep end after one bad day. One dressed up in flying rodent tights trying to save the world. The other got his skin bleached and promised to make the world smile to death. At least, that's how Joker sees it. In reality, this whole song is just him projecting. He's not trying to convince the bat that he needs the clown. He's trying to convince himself. He's the one who's oh, lost yeah, that's without true his own in the bat. Arkham Knight. And if there's one thing that truly frightens him, it's being people forgotten. forgotten. No, please. No. I need you. Bye-bye. Poetic. The song came out only a few years before Arkham Knight, and it predicted huh. Joker's final hours perfectly as he's forced to admit what we already knew. Alrighty, Joker's song has a lot of street cred, being one of the earliest fan-made villain songs out there. But what really places it this high on the list is how it encapsulates the Joker's narcissistic view of Batman. He repeatedly states how lost Bats would be without him, desperately hoping that if he says it enough, people will think it's the truth. And of course, being the clown prince, he hides it all behind his sadistic swagger. Kind of a shame this isn't an official song, because I could see Mark Hamill rocking this track. More so since it feels like Miracle of Sound really gets the character. You'd be lost, you'd be lost. Face it, Bats, you'd be lost without me. Yeah, it does sound like the Joker there. Makes sense since, for the most part, Rock said he got what made Batman and his baddies so... No! No, no you, you go can't. away! Bat you go away! You don't count! Stop. Back off! You're not kidding! <laughs> Come on. You know it's true. Sorry, but you just got in my way. I promise, oh. honey, I can't feel your pain. And maybe I enjoy okay. it just a little bit. Yeah, at least I'm an intro back. Oh! Hey, Nate! I actually remember this one. Wasn't it made before that, though? Okay, that I don't remember. Uh -huh. Does this count technically? We're not even going here. Yeah, I think I missed this one. Oh, I don't think I've seen that one before. I don't play League of Legends. Hey! I have a grab paddle. I always like to do. You're so much fun together. No one's dying to play with Joker. Except for maybe he's a legend! Okay. Who's the sheep? Guess what we are all tough. What the? I'm not doing anything, I swear. What is going on here? Josh? What happened? Huh? Oh. So he's finally back. King K. you. If you know your place, you can join him too. Put your claws together for a villain most cruel. Because this time... He's here. The tale of King, King K. K. Rool and his fandom is something truly special. To fully understand this song, we need to take a moment to reminisce about this crocodile's reign. Starting as the big bad for Donkey Kong Country, K. Mm -hmm. Rool at first glance seems to be your standard Bowser clone. Just stealing bananas from an ape instead of stealing a princess from an Italian. True. Take a closer look at things and, weirdly, K. Rool goes through a form of character <laughs> development? Yeah, K. Rool's story is complex enough to fill an entire segment on its own. But to keep this one for lasting 10 minutes, we'll go Thank through you. the Spark Notes version. Good. After the destruction of Crocodile Island in Donkey Kong Country 2, Oops. K. Rool kind of lost his mind in 64, outright threatening his minions with death and completely set on mass monkey murder. 
After well, that, to be fair, we did destroy his home, so I Microsoft can't be mad. Pretty much crippled the Donkey Kong Country series for the foreseeable future. And the Kremlin had their appearances relegated to just cameos and spinoffs if they were lucky. Until K. Rule's last physical appearance for 10 years in Super Mario Ten Sluggers. Years. Fans were desperate to see the back, and yet, nothing. Even as the Donkey Kong Country series returned, our king was never to be seen to again. Found. Here's where we find the Kremlings, worrying the same thing we are, mulling over their lack of work, as it were, wondering just where K. Rule had gone. But beneath their tavern, in the bowels of the ship, someone was stirring, mulling over his failures, and plotting. Immediately, K. Rule makes his presence known, and it, is that Benedict Campbell? In individuals, insanity is rare. Rules, cutthroats, countries, and cremospheres. It is the rule. Yup. This fan project really? has original voice actors from the cartoon on board. Wow. Campbell still manages to capture the king's slimy yet sophisticated voice. But what's a singer without their song? K. Rule's busted out a showstopper. Tip the scales. His ultimate plan is to bring the Kremlings back and to bring them back strong. The ultimate takeover of DK Isle. Burn the island to the ground to lure out Donkey Kong in one final invasion. If we tip the scale, I'll send them all to jungle jail. Must tip the scale. Yeah? Let's make that one sec. It's done. Fail. I will tip the scales. Reclaim our land, our holy goal. We shall not fail. Oh. We'll end this monkey's, monkey's tail. tail. We'll tip the Scale. Let's tip the scale. Oh, he's not just done there. Like K. Rule's own personas, the song switches genres like crazy. Really? Going from slow and dramatic to this faster as K. Rule laments his obsession with the Kongs. And then sounding almost heroic as K. Rule promises his minions a return to form. And as K. Rule storms the beaches of the island, stealing the banana horde with a chilling message of his return, the Kremlings break into a triumphant cry of victory and I am Kremling, I am king, we'll reclaim what's to be had. Take on asunder as we cry blood and thunder, my command is ironclad. God damn. But it was all in K. Rule's head. His Oof. delusions of grandeur have driven him to madness, a laugh turning into a cry. He might truly have been forgotten. Yet, in the post credits, Oof. we see that he's managed to at least show his face again to his minions. And as DK goofily forgets his nemesis, a contrast to the silent and angry figure K. Damn. Rule imagined him as, K. Rule gets an idea to crash a party. This was a prelude to his smash reveal. There is Dude. so much to dissect here. Return to Crocodile Island is a love letter to the entire story of the Kremlings, both in-game and meta-wise. There are so many references and gags to the history of Donkey Kong Country. So many people contributed to this work of art. Hey, Campbell. And Alex Henderson's animation is just oh, beautiful. And what puts it at number one is, well, this is a story only the fandom could have told. It's as much no about kidding. the fan's journey to get him into Smash and back into relevance as it is about K. Rule's resentment toward his hated enemy. I'm the Fiery Joker, and never forget the power of fandom. Raise your flags high, and never stop celebrating the things you love. Come. Amen. <laughs> True. The only way a fandom dies is the fans forget about it. It's kind of the deal. <laughs> uh, anyway, as you heard, I gotta go grab some dinner, so... Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you around for the next one. Good night.